I'll hand it over to you, Taylor. Okay, thanks, Max. So, um, hey everyone, uh, Taylor Hodge, Assistant Director and Lock4 Program Manager. So really good to see everyone again. I know you all have been very, very busy, um, but I just, you know, I I never just want to be the the voice behind like the email or the the Slack message. And I just felt like with everything going on um, here in the next few weeks, really wanted to pop in and kind of share what those opportunities are and answer any questions you might have. Um, so I'll just kind of start right at the top. Um, tonight, we have the virtual resume workshop with Paramount. Uh, the tech recruiter will be presenting um, about, you know, resume, you know, tips, tricks, what they look for. Um, she'll be speaking to a little bit about LinkedIn, I believe, and then also sharing a bit about her um, pathway into tech, too. Um, so that, again, is at six, and I think it sounds like everyone or most of you are joining that um, this evening. So looking forward to seeing you there shortly. Um, I think I had noted too, she's she's willing to review up to 50 resumes. So really cool opportunity there. Um, the next thing I wanted to promote was Jeff Knaus, so CEO and co-founder of Digital Hive. He'll be on campus next Thursday uh, from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Um, that'll be in Gruen Auditorium and totally happy to help you um, kind of navigate campus and give you tips on where to park too. So just let me know if you need any of that. Um, but he'll be on campus to really just talk about his journey and experiences. Um, and there's a really neat opportunity too. He'll be on campus earlier that day. So between two and three, uh, and, you know, we're just seeking students at this point, too, who may like to um, sit and have coffee with him. So if you're interested, um, definitely we had a little um, form that went out with that in the Slack channel. Um, just complete that Google form to let us know you're interested, and then you'll hear more on that. Um, questions on those two before I get into the other two opportunities? Okay. Um, so then, again? oh, sorry. Sorry. Where Jeff is from? What was the company again? Oh yeah, Digital Hive. Digital, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so they're a marketing firm um, right here in Syracuse. And then, okay, so the next one, so the following week, Wednesday, February 15th, um, Rob Simmons, who is the head of social impact at the Micron Foundation will be on campus. Um, he'll be there at four o'clock and he'll be um, providing the MLK, um, key, he'll be our MLK um, convocation speaker that evening. Um, so again, if you're able to, to join us for that, um, great opportunity there. And then also, um, last but not least, the one you saw I put in the Slack channel, I just wanted to kind of tee it up because I figured I'd promote it here and then now you have it in the Slack channel as well. It's the Lemoyne College Career Fair. Um, you'll see, I, I put in the list of employers who will be at that, but there are, um, I believe, 84 employers registered for the event. Um, the college ended up with a wait list, which is really wonderful. So um, again, this is open to you. And um, like I said, big turnout. Remembering tech is really infused across industries too, right? So you'll see a good mix of, you know, manufacturing, um, hospitality, you know, insurance, financial institutions, especially. So great opportunity to get in there, network, and just see the types of opportunities that are available to you. We will have an Erie 21 table in the lobby of the rec center. So we'll have water, lint rollers, whatever you need. We'll have maps too, to help kind of point you in the right direction too. Because when you get in there, right, there's a lot of employers. Um, so to maximize your time, we can kind of point you in the right direction too. Um, and we're just there too, if you want to practice your elevator pitch and, or you just need to, you know, after you talk to some employers want to come out and like debrief, like Kanan, myself, we'll be there to talk to. Um, and then for any of these, I just always want to remind you, right? You're, you're an Erie 21 student. You have access to the Erie 21 house, um, in the career closet that is in there as well. So if you're interested on any, you know, in, in looking through the closet, um, definitely check that out. We always recommend for the career fair, smart casual. Um, and I can, I can drop a, a little quick link in there too, like what, what qualifies as smart casual, but no, no suit tie, none of that is, is needed. Um, smart casual. So I'll, 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 I'll send over a little link on that. Um, but again, if you want to look for any pieces, you're welcome to borrow or you can um, keep too. And I will know, I think today I saw we had some stuff dropped off into our career closet, some nice like winter coats. So 
if ever you want to check that out, um, send me a Slack message or I am going to give you my cell number as well. Um, just let me know. So those are really, those are the big things coming up. And I just wanted to make sure I um, drop by to, to promote, but do you have any questions for me? We will also be pretty flexible with our class schedule. I'm going to, uh, over the weekend, overlay all the upcoming events um, with our classes as well. Um, and then we can push class back. Like I know um, that that um, guest speaker, I'm super interested to attend. Um, so we may just shift class back like a half hour that day just to give everyone time to, you know, have to experience the full lecture and then still be able to make it on for class. Great. Thanks, Max. Thanks for doing that. Well, well, thanks again for letting me crash the start of class, and I look forward to to seeing you all shortly on the resume workshop. And again, don't don't hesitate to reach out with any questions after the fact. All right. Thanks so have, much, Taylor. Great have seeing a good you. Night. Bye. Good to see everyone. Bye bye. So Taylor mentioned an elevator pitch. I'm sure most of you guys are aware of what that is, but does someone want to take a stab at how they would define an elevator pitch? or the origins of the word elevator pitch? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I say like it's an, you know, an idea or a proposal of, uh, you know, some kind of business idea or software idea to a higher up or somebody who has the ability to help you with that idea. So. Yeah. So it's called an elevator pitch, and I, I'm blanking on the the who actually pulled this off, but someone uh, was trying to get a meeting with someone that, you know, that was way outclassed them and they could never get on their calendar. And they figured out what elevator that person would be in um, and just happened to wait in the lobby to see that person walk in. And they rode the elevator up with that person to whatever floor the, the person was going to. And they needed to get everything they needed to hook them in, in the time that they were in the elevator before the person got out of the elevator. Um, and so it's called an elevator pitch because the idea is, is that you can hook someone on um, in the time that it takes to ride an elevator. Um, and that's really, really important because you do not want to be rambling, but you want to get everything across. So think about an elevator pitch as the MVP for introducing yourself. So you want to have a, a couple sentence uh, prepared uh, and rehearsed and, you know, try it in the mirror, actually try it with friends and family and say, you know, hi, my name is Max Matthews. Um, I'm a senior software developer and instructor at a coding bootcamp. I've worked in the software industry for the past 10 years, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to get to know you a little bit more, or I'm looking for a job uh, with an entry-level position. Now you can, obviously that, that would be mine. That's very specific to me, but, um, when I ask a lot of students, hey, introduce yourself, I either get something too short, hi, my name is, I'm a careers and code student, and that's it, or I get a life saga that takes about 10 minutes to hear all about your journey and everywhere you've been. Um, and that is not to say um, that it is uh, bad to be able to talk about yourself, but you kind of want to hook the person in and then have them be uh, able to take the conversation wherever they want. So they could follow up with, oh, what's the coding boot camp? Or that's interesting. What languages have you learned? Or what's the most interesting thing that you've learned so far? Or why are you interested in our company? Or there's so many different places that conversation can go. But that elevator pitch gets you over your nerves because it's well rehearsed. It's your opportunity to get to engage in the conversation. And as with coding, getting started is always the hardest part. Um, and so having that rehearsed, uh, that rehearsed kind of introduction can be really helpful at a job fair or at uh, any social event at um, Open Hack, which we will be attending next Thursday, um, anything like that. Um, Latonia asked, it is around about 30 seconds, uh, give or take. You don't need a stopwatch. You don't need to practice getting it out as soon as possible. There is no 
uh, no prize for having the shortest or the fastest elevator pitch, but it's something to think about, right? Because talking about yourself is always a little hard. And this is your opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to say, hi, my name is, where do I take it from there? Um, everyone's elevator pitch is, is a little different, but it's your good rehearsal to kind of jumpstart the conversation by putting the person on a pretty good foundation, right? You're introducing yourself. You're letting them get to know you. Um, that is your, your point of an elevator pitch. Um, Taylor also uh, mentioned uh, smart casual. Uh, you know, you don't need to, to be showing up in, in a tux. Um, you also shouldn't be showing up in a sweatshirt that's super warm because it's going to be freezing tonight. Uh, so somewhere in between those two, uh, they say dress to impress. Um, that is becoming less important, um, especially now that that we're all virtual and a lot of people do their jobs from home. Uh, but it still is important, right? You wanna you wanna have a good first impression, uh, and before you can even open your mouth, the person will have an impression of you, right? So uh, clothes clothes kind of set that expectation. Um, and Lemoyne has a, a bunch of great resources available at the Erie Twenty One House. Um, if you wanted to, after this workshop, you could reach out to Taylor and say, hey, uh, I'm working on my elevator pitch. Is there a time early next week I can meet with you to practice that? That's a totally reasonable thing, right? Um, the elevator pitches are always tough because you feel like you're really going to get it. And then you get on your first interview or at your first job fair, uh, even your first mock interview, which is coming up in Careers in Code, and you freeze up. And you kick yourself and you go, I can't, why did I freeze up? I was so practiced on this. Well, you were practicing with yourself. The brain goes in an entirely different mode when you're interacting with someone else. So uh, practicing that uh, is very important, but also practice it with uh, people in the Hack Up State community, right? Or at Open Hack. Um, you never know when a job uh, opportunity is going to pop up. Um, and I'm going to look up this stat because I'm going to keep saying it until the cows come home. Uh, what percentage of jobs are found through networking? 85% of all jobs are found through uh, networking. And we don't mean IP addresses and routers there. We mean actually getting out who you know, who you talk to, that first impression, whether it's a job fair, whether it's open hack. Um, all different kinds of opportunities there. Um, and a ton of opportunities come through the Hack Up State Network, right? Our newsletter list, uh, we just sent out our email and went out to 2,700 people. And one of the things in that email, if you didn't uh, get a copy of the newsletter, was we have an opportunity, we share jobs uh, in the local community. And then we also have a link to say, hey, if you have a job, shoot us the information and we'll make sure to include it. Um, in our next newsletter. So we do have a lot of people coming to us asking for um, to, to promote their job. And we try to take all of our graduates and route them in there. You would not believe the number of times I have responded to an email and said, hey, any chance you would consider entry level or junior level developers for this position? Um, and a lot of employers are willing to work with us and drop their uh, college degree requirement or say, yeah, if the right person came around, we would definitely be willing to train them. So um, that is not unheard of in our industry. Any questions about an elevator pitch? Any questions about you should when you show up to the job fair, make sure you have printed copies of your resume. Um, that is always important. Um, or a business card. Business cards are uh, also an important tool. Uh, you can go on Vistaprint and get business cards for super cheap. Um, that is a good idea to do now as opposed to waiting until the end of the program. Not only is that a great use of your stipend uh, funds, but that is also... Um, it will also take about two or three weeks to get to you. Um, Vistaprint is a Canadian company, um, but a ton of other great companies out there. Um, Moo, uh, M-O-O, -O is a uh, UK-based printer, and they do really high-end stuff. Um, you will pay more for their business cards, but you will know when you have a Moo business card in your hand uh, because it's not flimsy. It's nice thick cardboard. You can get rounded edges, all of that stuff. So... I would say, and everyone has a different opinion on this, 
don't go for the top of line business card, but don't go for the cheapest of the cheap because there is something to be said than just the design on your business card. When people have your business card in their hand, they are going to be able to feel the paper and look at that design and know how much you spent on a business card. You have you use business cards so infrequently anymore, you don't need 10,000 business cards to get started in your first order. All you need is maybe 100 or 250. So my advice would be spring a little bit more for the design. Um, but what I like to do is if I show up at a job fair, I've got my uh, resume, my cover letter, and my uh, business card either all stapled together or uh, paper clipped together. And it's these little tricks that matter because if it's a if it's stapled or paper clipped together, all of a sudden that metal is making your resume be heavier. It's going to make your resume stick out a little bit from everyone else at that job fair that just handed their one page resume over. Um, and so having all of those together, uh, all of a sudden that that recruiter is going to have your business card sitting on their de desk in an entirely separate pile than all the different resumes that are going to get all intermixed together. Um, the other thing that I would I like to do and I recommend, especially at job fairs, get a business card of the person you talk to. 95% of the time, they will either have a business card or uh, you can ask them for their email and you can jot down that information. When you jot it down, have a notebook with you, have pen and paper ready or have your phone, putting it in your phone is totally fine. You want their name, their title, the name of their company, and then their email address. And what you want to do is after that job fair, as soon as you get home or within 24 hours, you want to email them and say, thank you for your time. I'm looking into the open positions or um, I look forward to reviewing what positions you have open or it was great talking to you about and you put the job title directly in, in, that, uh, in that position, uh, in that email. Um, and uh, as a follow-up on that, you can also write a personalized cover letter. You could do that going into the job fair. If there are five companies that you're particularly interested in, you could write your cover letter in advance. But in your follow-up email with that person, you want to include your resume and your cover letter. Um, and maybe you wait until after the job fair because you talk to them at the job fair and they say, we don't have any open positions right now. Well, you don't want to spend a ton of time writing a cover letter um, for a company that you're not super interested in, but every cover letter, you should have some research into that company, even if it's reading the about page, even if it's reading the products page. Um, I will be doing mock interviews as part of the uh, program Laura sets up, and I do those interviews not as your instructor. I do them as CTO of Tuzak. And so when you get an, an interview with me and my you sign up for a slot, it doesn't say hack upstate under it. It says Tuzak. And I expect you before you show up in an interview, before I spend 30 minutes getting to know you, for you to get to know my company. Um, you don't need to go super in depth, but I want you to know what I do at my company before I start talking to you. Because why would I ever consider hiring you and having you work at my company if you don't even know what we do? Um, and so that is probably my biggest, biggest, biggest pet peeve of interviewing when people show up and they go, oh, I want to be a developer. Even if you could say, oh, I find it interesting that you use Meteor or JavaScript and I want a job using JavaScript. That's great. But if you show up and you're just there for the questioning, Remember, it should not feel like an interrogation. It should feel like a conversation. The way you can make that happen is prep for the call, do your research on the company, figure out why you're excited to work there, and get them to understand that you're excited to work there. Your interview and your cover letter are your two first opportunities to do that. Even if they don't ask for a cover letter, including that cover letter in a follow-up email, now, all of a sudden, you it wasn't just one interaction with that person for three minutes at the career fair. They now have your name in, your, in their memory twice because you emailed them and followed up. It is so, so, so important to track, whether it's in a spreadsheet or a note, 
every interaction that you have. Don't just apply to a company. If you apply to a company, follow up. Have dates of when you should be following up, what their email address is, if you've reached out to them on LinkedIn, if you've done your research before the interview, when your interviews are booked, getting a job is a full-time job. So treat it like it. Make sure that you focus in on that. And Laura will have all of those tips for you as well. Um, but I like to do my own little mini spiel because I have been on both sides of, of hiring. I've done hundreds of interviews, both for real positions and mock, mock interviews. Um, you, you gain a lot from it. The biggest thing is prep and have your questions ready and make sure you know about that company that you're interviewing with. Max, I have a question. Shoot. Um, for the business card, is your business card more traditional, just like name, contact info, or do you have like a .dev site on there? And do you recommend for or against if people have like a .dev site, that's their name, if they just put that on their business card? Yeah. So if you would like, you can send um, any of your business card designs to me. Like I said, Vistaprint and Moo are the two that I really like and recommend. Um, with that said, you can get business cards printed up at Staples and they'll have them ready for you in like two or three hours. Um, so if you're on a crunch and you like are headed to the career event, you can order on Staples the night before and have it ready the next day, which is, is a good tip. Um, my business card is available on my website. Um, the only thing that I don't like about my current website, and once you finish your first dev website, you immediately start to hate it and want to redo it. Um, that is a common, common feeling, but, um, my website, the only thing that it's missing is a, is a, uh, Are we yours? oh, am I not sharing? I just see a blank. Maybe it was just me. I just saw a desktop. There we go. Um, this is my dev site. Um, I was not able to get maxmatthews.com. If it ever becomes available, I will be the first one to grab it. Um, you guys have probably seen this a gazillion times with my calendar link, um, but it is my name, but with a .ws because Western Samoa is .ws, and I just happen to be able to grab that with my, my name in the URL. Um, in my website, I've linked to my resume. The other thing that really needs to get updated on this site is my resume. I've been really bad. You're supposed to update your resume every six months to a year, even if you're not in the job market, because you never know when a recruiter is going to come after you. And if you don't have your resume up to date, think about what you're doing in a job and how much of that can change in a year, or if you get promoted, or if your title changes, or whatever it is. So you are supposed to update your resume every six months to a year. Um, and then I also have my business card linked on the site. Um, this is the design of my business card. You can see that I go th through this like uh, material design with a, a bunch of different gradients. Um, and if you refresh the site, you get like a different one every time. Um, but I try to be consistent with my branding. So I have, this is my business card. It's double-sided. One has my old MZM logo on it. I've got to update all of this. And then this is the back of my business card with my name and phone number and email and all of that kind of stuff. Um, this is just my this is just my approach, right? And this is now almost five years old and due for another overhaul. Um, but this is this is kind of my design. And then I also have my resume on here, and you can see I keep the branding consistent throughout, uh, and then have all of my information in here. Don't use this as an example. I was do as I say, not as I do. I have not updated this uh, through two different promotions and a, a bunch of other different information. Um, but everyone's going to give you different advice on a resume. Do not get frustrated um, when you have one person advise one thing and you go make that change everywhere. And then you meet with someone else and they go, no, 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 that's a terrible idea. Don't use bullets. And you're like, but the last person told me to use bullets. Uh, go for what feels right. With that said, if you have any career questions or any questions pop up, um, write them down. I will answer them as soon as we get back. We're going to switch over to the resume workshop. That is a different Zoom link that I will drop in the Zoom chat and in the Slack live stream. 
I will see you guys over there. And then as soon as that uh, meeting is over, I will see you back in this Zoom room as always. Any questions on the resume workshop before you switch over? Cool. I will see you guys over in that Zoom link. So I just want to debrief with everyone on that call. Um, we often do this at work, right? Whenever we have a third party uh, meeting, we, we like to take everyone who was on the call and kind of say, all right, what did we get from it? What were the important parts? And then most importantly, what are your action items? What are the things that you learned from that call that you want to follow up on? The most obvious action item on that should obviously be taking your resume, sending it into that careers uh, at Lemoyne email address um, and, and asking for a, a review. Um, but other than that, what did you guys pick up from that call or that meeting or that presentation or whatever you want to call it? When it comes to resumes, you need to pay attention to details and make sure that um, you're following a certain structure. And once you decide what structure you want to go with, you stick to the structure and the um, template of it instead of veering off, um, paying attention to how you word the statements and um, the tenses that you're actually using and make sure that you stick to one of them consistently. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and oftentimes, you know, you'll hear recruiters be like, always oh, use the present tense so that you're in the moment or, you know, you did that in the past. So always use the past tense. I think the, the main point there was like, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're consistent with it, right? Um, and and that, that goes for... Um, that goes for a lot of things, right? Going for your formatting, going for, uh, I really liked the uh, example resume that she showed that she liked because it had a lot of information in it, um, but it wasn't all left aligned. They took advantage of light well, of right alignment, right? To put in the, the dates and the examples in there. They used bold and, and regular text, but that was still offset. They used horizontal rules, which are a really important design element. Um, and so um, it, it's funny when she showed the uh, the B resume with all of the design on it. How many of you guys went, it looks like Max's resume. So I will say as a quick note on that, um, there is a reason why my, res my resume is so heavily designed. I never want to work for a company that has 130,000 applications in three weeks. Now, I have the luxury of saying, hey, I'm a senior developer. I know where I work well. I'm not going to work well in a big company. I'm going to work well when the person reviewing my resume does not have an application tracking system. That's the ATS that she mentioned. Um, that is keeping track of thousands of different applications, right? Uh, I'm not going to be a good fit working in a big company, at least unless it's a very small kind of regionalized team. And so because of that, I've had recruiters look at my resume and go, oh my God, I can't believe you put every logo on there. That means our application tracking system cannot parse out that resume, see what the name of the application is, um, and and be able to list that as a skill for you. And I went, great, that's why I did it. I don't want some computer trying to sum me down. Um, there are, I'm, I'm glad she mentioned that Paramount doesn't uh, use that technique. There is a human reviewing every resume. There are some companies that take your resume and put it into a parser, put it into sometimes some AI, and they give your resume a score from zero to 100. And if you're not above a certain score, they just ignore your resume and never get back to you. Believe it or not, at a, at a company as big as Paramount, um, I would not be surprised if they use that system. Um, it also sometimes eliminates some bias, which is uh, a, a piece of advice for why you shouldn't put yourself on your resume is that there is... Uh, bias is part of human nature, unfortunately. Um, and so sometimes they rely on those application tracking systems to remove that initial bias by trying to score you based off of what you have on your resume. Um, so the big thing that I took out of that is just be consistent. 
Um, and in fact, uh, based off of me getting that feedback a while ago, um, on my website, I actually have a uh, text-based resume as well. And so you can um, get all of that same information, except it's all it's all uh, just text design only. Um, let me pull up. Um, I used a resume service called Credle, I think it was called. Um, nope. Um, uh, uh, so if you go to my resume, you see I've got my graphic one, um, and then I do have an all text-based one as well. Um, and so this is, uh, to their point, a little pop of color, but nothing, you know, going overboard. Um, and it has consistent format and layout. So this is a website called credle.io. If you're looking, if you hate doing design work, if you hate working in Google Docs and Word, and all you want to do is punch in your information, um, credle is a great option for that. Um, it is not widely used, but you can see it produces a pretty nice, easy resume. And the other nice thing about this is it gives you a link. So you can just link to someone's uh, link to your resume from your current site, and that will all be taken care of from there. Um, any other notes that you guys got from that uh, presentation? Can I can I just note, Max, before someone else jumps in? Um, your, your resume is nothing like the one she showed. That person had like their address and it was like a random like street sign and like it was all over the place um and for people who are creative and I feel like I'm really creative you can have like some design in there like you really structured yours so I think it was like nothing at all like the example we saw um so I just wanted to put that out there the one thing I liked about what they talked about is the advocacy um you know talking about your resume may not necessarily reflect what you can bring and then being a voice for you um so I just want to toss that out there too great points um, yeah, and, and I think I, I really resonated on the part where she said, you know, it doesn't really matter if it's working at McDonald's or working at somewhere where you don't feel is relevant. Um, and a lot of you guys will either have career gaps or have entirely different career histories. And to her point, that's all good experience, right? There are things showing, uh, you don't want to show, hey, I've never worked before. You want to say, hey, these are the experiences that I've had. Um, and even if I haven't had a job before, this is how I'm engaging. Um, OpenHack is a great example, right? OpenHack is a community that you guys are part of. You can list OpenHack as a monthly uh, meetup for software developers and people in the technology in industry. And you can say, um, networked and furthered my skills by uh, communicating in a uh, social setting, you know, something like that. You want to embellish a little bit. You don't want to make anything up, but your resume is kind of your chance to brag about you. Um, I really like the fact where she said, you don't want to just say, I hired a team of people. You want to say that, you know, you've hired 20 different people through rounds of uh, interviewing and you want to think about it, right? You want to embellish it a little bit. Um, the most important part, and I'm actually going to just copy and paste my notes directly in here. Um, I don't know if you guys saw me looking like this right now on the camera. Um, that is because I have my notes up on my, my second monitor. Um, here are just a copy and paste of all of the notes that I took from that meeting some of which I was copying and pasting right off of her slides, right? The little pieces about like, hey, the resume components that are really important. Um, those are, I wanted that. So I just took a quick screenshot of that. The, um, the uh, her bullet points, right? Of the clear and concise bullets, keep it to one page, all of that stuff, super important. Um, I cannot stress the, the, the last one, uh, the second to last one in the uh, second bullet group, always, always, always upload your resume as a PDF. Always. I don't care if you go, but it looks so pretty in Word. 
If I see a Word document, I will hesitate to even open it to review you as a candidate because the PDF will load right in my browser. And when I'm going through 50 different applicants, I can just open it in a tab. I don't have to uh, download anything. I don't have to worry about what the file name of it is. And when I'm waiting four minutes for Word to bounce up and down in my doc before it opens the resume, I've already gone on and reviewed about eight other candidates. And then when it finally does open, I go, oh, this is some Word file. It's using a font that I don't have installed. Nothing is formatted properly. Take the three minutes and export it to a PDF. Word can do it. Google Docs can do it. Doesn't matter what you build your resume in, just make sure that when you send off your resume, it is a PDF. And don't put any special characters in your file name either. Don't put Max Matthews apostrophe resume. Don't get fancy and, uh, you know, put an emoji in it or some symbol or dashes and underscores are okay. Other than that, no special characters in your file names. You would be surprised at how many of these application tracking systems do not handle those file names properly. And that recruiter just goes, I can't open their resume, on to the next one. There's your entire six seconds gone by, right? Um, and she's not kidding about the six seconds. It is literally six seconds. Let me see your education. Let me see what your last job was. There's your six seconds. That's all you have. And they go through this. I'm not kidding you like Tinder. On to the next one. Swipe to the right. Swipe to the right. Nope, not this one. They didn't put education on there. Swipe over to the left. These recruiters are, that is it. There is no notes. There is no, oh, let's have another person review this. They are literally hitting the the A button on their keyboard or the S button or the left and right keys or the, they may not actually be swiping on their phones, but that is how these guys are going through those big, um, now that's not to say that's how hiring works across the industry, right? That's how hiring works at big companies for sure, uh, but that is, that's not how it works universally. That's, um, you know, so know where you're applying to. If I were applying to a company the size of Paramount, there's no way in hell I would be uploading my my pretty PDF with all my design work on it. I would be uploading, uh, maybe I'd have a little bit of color in there. I would uh, have my header rows, but um, I will also share the resume that um, she shared as a good example. Um, I did take a screenshot of that. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Select it, upload it. Um, in case you want to reference that, um, that's a that's a great example. Um, I will say just quickly for all of my additional notes, some of them were a verbatim quote of what she said. Some of them are my personal notes that I interjected there. So I don't want you to think that like she said it directly as a quote. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there. The last thing that I want to talk about is um, you guys hear about a career ladder all the time. Have you guys ever heard the term career lattice? So a career ladder is what we think, right? You got to be climbing the career ladder. You got to always be um, trying to move up. And a career ladder is always in the same company. Um, I can't remember who it was. It might be McKinsey but I'm not sure on that said, your career does not follow a straight path up. Your career will have many side steps in it, whether that's a side step to another company, whether that's a side step into a different uh, industry, whether that is, hey, I'm uh, stepping into software development, but then I'm taking careers in code. Well, that's not a career step. That is part of your career lattice to say, I got all of this experience. I moved up, right? Now, you may decide now that you're at that lattice, right? Not just left and right, but up and down, that you say, I got through careers in code. Taking it a step up would be saying, hey, I'm going to get an entry-level software development job. But maybe you say, you know what, project management and working on my capstone and making sure I got everything done on that, that's where I want to go next. So maybe you take a sidestep over and take a project management course or you get a project management job. Uh, identifying there that the 
only way forward in your career is not necessarily always up. It's not about getting that next job title or that next raise. Sometimes it's moving laterally. Sometimes it's uh, going into that other industry or taking another class, right? And so uh, it used to be 50 years ago that you that was the, the career ladder, follow, going up the corporation, making it up to senior level, whatever, and then retiring on a good salary was it. But it is often considered a career lattice as opposed to a career ladder. Um, and when you kind of open up your thinking about that, it becomes easier to identify, hey, me uh, going over to the side here and working or taking a new um, uh, class in a different field is still advancing my career. It's just not necessarily moving it up or down. It may be uh, expanding you to more, more ideas. Um, take a note. Uh, take a minute to read through my notes. I really, really like the fact that she said that communication is so important. Um, I take this many notes in about every meeting that I'm in, and I will take this many notes in and in, in a 30 minute interview. I, I am the only thing that I jot down is things that I would care to remember after the meeting. There may be other things discussed, but what I'm taking notes on is, hey, what's going to benefit me after this meeting? For an interview, it is going to be, hey, why does this candidate stand out to me? And what did they answer that not only I liked, but more importantly, that I didn't like? That's what I do uh, on the side of an interviewer. But you guys... Uh, take advantage of the one of the last uh, bullet points that I put in there. Take notes after you interact with someone, right? Immediately afterwards, be that standout person, right? Um, everything they were saying with the thank you note, I totally agree with. Um, in fact, I don't know that there was anything said in that meeting that I didn't uh, totally agree with, um, which is not common. Normally, you meet a recruiter or two and you go, uh-uh, that's not how I do my recruiting, but I was very much in, in sync with her. Um, and I think that that's a, a, a great opportunity, not only to uh, have your resume reviewed, but just to kind of soak in and imbue all of that knowledge that was thrown your way. Um, and if you're someone who learns text-based, um, don't be afraid to jot down notes in the middle of a meeting or open up a notes uh, in Google Docs or whatever and start jot jotting down some, some items. Um, especially any action items, anything that you go, oh, you know what, I need to go do that on my resume. Um, don't be afraid to, to, you know, take notes throughout the meeting on that. Schneider, go ahead. So um, I did a complete career shift and whatnot. And beforehand, I was just a college student working, you know, dead in, you know, fast food, blah, blah, blah jobs. So I don't have any relevant experience towards the field. So I was going to say, how do I go about you know, doesn't it matter. Look nice. Yeah. So she uh, made one note saying, hey, if you're in the middle of a career change, um, your education should go at the top. Otherwise, your education should go down at the bottom. And I think that's a great note because I hear that all the time of, well, what whatever's at the top of the resume in those six seconds is what's going to be read. So if you have education, careers in code, six month full stack boot camp, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, React, Node, Express, Postgres, that's it. That's what I want to know, right? And if you want to throw some metric in there about the number of hours that you were in a, a live class, that's great. If you want to talk about uh, building a full stack project for your capstone that integrated data from multiple sources, that's great. But what I want to see when I'm hiring someone, what languages did you learn? Because if I see React in there, I go, great. They're not learning old school JavaScript. They're learning what's being used in the industry. If I see Postgres in there, I go, great. They understand relational databases. If I see Node in there, I go, great. They know some back-end programming language, not just front-end JavaScript. I want to see all of those letters out there. Now, a recruiter probably doesn't know all of those different languages, but they do know what category those languages are in. Um, if you ever meet a recruiter that says Java and JavaScript are the same thing, run away as 
fast as you humanly can from that company. I can promise you, you do not want to work there. It is not worth it, no matter how much they are paying. Um, and don't make that mistake yourself of, oh, this is a Java job. I know JavaScript. I'm sure I'll be able to do this as well. Um, Java is a perfectly fine language, and, and you can learn it based off of everything you know from JavaScript. They are not one in the same. For the love of God, they are not one in the same. Um, I have also seen job postings that have requested 15 years of React experience. I have bad news for the company. React has not been around for 15 years. So the very founder uh, and author of React itself could not meet the requirement for 15 years of React experience. Uh, so take any years of experience with a grain of salt. Um, if they're looking for 10 to 15 years of experience, chances are you're probably not going to get that job. Uh, but if they're looking for two to three and you say, well, I've got six months, that's enough. Apply for it, right? Um, you do not need to, to, you need to fill a slight majority of all the requirements. You do not need to fill 100% of the requirements. Um, and when you see other um when you see other languages and go, oh, this is a Python job. I don't know Python. Well, if they're putting junior in the job title, that means they are willing to train you on that. So what I would suggest is if you actually get an interview, if they're giving you the time of day, uh, go, go to W3 schools and look at Python. Look at that list of concepts and go, oh, you know, a variable is a variable. And, you know, they don't actually have arrays in Python. They have something called lists. That will give you a little bit of a confidence boost to realize, oh, key value pairs are not called objects, they're called dictionaries. Okay, same concept, same way of writing the code, just a different word or a different syntax around that. Um, so if you do see other um, technical requirements, read that job description, figure out, hey, they may not have put full stack in the job title, uh, but is this job description saying they want a full stack developer? And if it is, how can I take the skills I already know and apply that into the job? Max, can I add another thought? Because yeah. it stood out to me that they just had a lot of enthusiasm about what they were doing. And I really liked how they interacted. I know um, sometimes people will show up for a presentation or something and they just kind of give you the vibe they kind of don't really want to be there and I didn't get that from them and I think that's a great sign as far as um, what they're doing with the students and stuff absolutely anyone who is giving a presentation and says please save questions to the end and then never answers the questions red flag right um you definitely want to be interacting with someone who feels personable who feels like you can ask the questions um and I will say that I got a compliment uh, that you guys were engaged, that you were asking questions, that you had your cameras on. Um, I really appreciate that, right? This is a, a two-way relationship with Erie 21. Um, and even though they are not paying for this cohort in particular, they made it very clear that they wanted you guys to have access to the same benefits um, that other cohorts uh, had access to through through that that program. So keep in mind that you do have access to all the Lemoyne career resources. Um, there is a link that I posted in my notes towards the bottom of the um, interviewing steps with the uh, the uh, Lemoyne Career Development Department. Um, check that out. Um, there are fifty seven questions to ask your interviewer. You can read. A gazillion of those articles, there are a ton of them, uh, but it's worth reviewing that list. Um, and I really enjoyed also the, I agreed with the ask for a 10 minute coffee chat and don't say, hey, I'd like 10 minutes to sell you on why I want you to give me a job. Say, hey, I'd like 10 minutes to learn more about you and what your career path was and what you do at company, whatever. That is a great way in. Um, you guys know that I make my calendar publicly available, right? And that uh, not just you guys as students, but anyone can grab a meeting with me. I've had students say, hey, I don't know if I'm the right fit for the program, so I'm not going to apply. But then they schedule a 12-minute meeting with me, and they end up being an awesome student because they took the time, they reached out, they got to know me a little bit more, and because they got to know me, they ended up going into the program. So um, communication, very important. 
realize that everyone freezes up a little bit during interviews. If you are someone who does that, take advantage of the mock interview uh, program that uh, not only Laura will get uh, out to you guys in the next couple of weeks, but also lean on on Taylor, right? See if, if you could do a mock interview with her or pretend, ask her, if, hey, I, I'm curious about your career path or what you're working on with Erie 21. Can we have a 10 minute coffee chat? That's a great option as well. Uh, and you can uh, reach out to your TAs. You can reach out to basically anyone in the Hack Upstate network, or we'll be at Open Hack this time next month, uh, next week. Um, that's also another great opportunity to practice. Alba. Um, just a quick question. Um, I went for an interview on Monday, and I got the second interview by Tuesday. But they already nice. offered me the position today. Wow. <laughs> I haven't had the chance to actually send an email or anything should I send an email still or should I just um speak to them in person when I go in for the job um you can definitely send an email there are very few times that a thank you note is not relevant one of my um personal tricks I I don't I trick is in the right word techniques um is to send a handwritten thank you card um, I know that that sounds super old school, um, but just like the weight of your business card or the little trick of having a paper clip or a staple in it, um, the handwritten thank you card is something that's going to end up on their desk at some point. Um, and so even, even though you've already gotten the job uh, opportunity, um, that thank you card is, is again, bringing them, bringing you to the top of their mind, seeing, seeing your name on it. Um, with that said, yes, a thank you note, like I said, is very rarely inappropriate. Um, and so sending a note may even buy you time in either, um, I don't know if they said like, hey, normally when you get a job uh, offered, they say we need to know by, you know, X number of days. Um, but send the thank you note because that either may buy you more time if you do need it, um, or it sets you up for negotiations. Um, never ever, ever accept a first salary offer. Um, just like when you uh, buy a house, there's going to be some negotiating on it. Even if they come back to you, um, there are some job positions like grant-based positions where they say, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't negotiate on price at all. But the only way you may know that is if you say, hey, is there room to negotiate on this? Unless they explicitly say there's no room for negotiation, you should be negotiating. And even when you um, they say there's no room for negotiation, that means that there's no salary room for negotiation. That doesn't mean that there's not room for negotiation on time off, on 401k retirement benefits, on health insurance on equipment provided to you, you may say, hey, I know there's no room for uh, negotiation on salary, but uh, is a laptop included to get my work done? That may be a thousand dollars out of your pocket that you don't have. And they may say, well, we don't normally give our employees a laptop, but because you're asking about it during the negotiation process, we can include that or we can bake that in. Um, so always negotiate. This was um, a grant-based position, which I already knew going into it, but I did negotiate on benefits and everything. And it has awesome benefits, 20 days of time off starting. So it's nice. really nice. And the 401k and the insurance fully paid for and everything. Um, so I was able to get some other stuff besides the salary because the salary was grant-based, um, but I'm going on vacation starting Monday. So I'm not, I'm going to be out for two weeks. I'm going to start right after I come back from vacation. So um, I just wanted to see to, I could send them out a uh, thank you letter um, while I'm in Puerto Rico. So yes. when they come back, they have already gotten it. And a thank you email is, is totally fine. I don't want to discount that. Um, but there's just something to be said about when you get something in the mail and, you know, it, it gets in the mailbox, it's in your slot. Yeah. Um, there's some, there's something to be said for that, for sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And Schneider. I also, oh, oh sorry. I'll come to you next again. 
Exona. Sorry. I wow. How long has it been? Ah, uh, Schneider, go ahead. Um, to bust off of what Elbow is saying regarding the emails, what would you say is like the time limit? Not even a time limit, but like a good, like let's say you meet somebody today and then you don't really have time to write that follow up within the same day, you know, like, you know. 24 hours is the goal. Um, up to 72 hours is totally fine. Um, and then I would say normally a week to two weeks to follow up with them. Um, and I know uh, during the last cohort, um, Laura was actually hiring for a, a position and she shared an email that she got with uh, got from an applicant that was like, when do you know if you're going to be hiring me or not? And it's like, whoa, how can you be that aggressive in an email, you know, like, um, now, I will counter that by saying you can write a nice email about, hey, I hope your application process is going well. I know there must be a lot of uh, other applicants for this awesome opportunity. I just wanted to know if you had a timeline of whether or not I knew I was going to get moved to the next freight phase. Okay, now you're being polite, you're respecting their time, and you're also saying, hey, I just want to know what the timeline is because they may get back to you and say, sorry, we moved on uh, to the next phase and you you didn't make it. Okay, well, kind of rude for them not to tell you that. But when you have 130,000 applicants, you can't tell all of them you didn't make it to the next phase. Um, and so um, the other thing that I would advise is if you get past more than the screener, if a hiring manager or someone spends time with you, don't expect an answer to this. But don't be afraid to ask, hey, I'm really bummed out. I didn't get the, the position. Is there any feedback you can give me on my interview or resume so that I might be a better fit uh, for your company the next time a position opens? Okay, you really want the feedback because you want to know what you did wrong in the interview. And the answer may just be you don't have enough experience. But if you phrase it like that, now all of a sudden, you've got a foot in the door for the next time that that job gets opened up, right? Um, and the answer may be, hey, you didn't have enough backend experience. Well, great. Now you know that your next portfolio project should get a little bit more backend practice. Um, sometimes it's not, it's out of your control. Sometimes they may say, um, hey, you submitted your application right at the end of our process and we had another candidate who was already going through the interviewing and we decided to go with them. Sure, no problem, but don't be afraid to ask and, and solicit for feedback, not only on your resume or cover letter, but also on, on the interview. And that's why um, when you're in the job process, develop some system that works for you. Because you're going to be applying to a ton of different places. You're going to be writing personalized cover letters uh, for some of those you're going to be reaching out to people in person. Uh, you're going to need to send thank you notes after any interaction. And you're also going to want to schedule follow-ups for that interaction. So Trello is a great system that you can use for that. You can kind of build your own list um, and take notes and set due dates in there. But if you have some uh, organization system that works for you guys, um, whether it's the Reminders app on your phone or... Um, you know, whatever you use, uh, that's totally fine. If you don't use anything, I would recommend checking out Trello. That can be a really, uh, a really good tool for that. Exona. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention this um, regarding pay and like kind of bargaining your pay. Um, I read a study that says that women are 70% less likely to negotiate their pay. They're more likely to accept their first pay offer but one thing that I want everyone to understand is whenever you apply even if it is in a public sector or in the private sector um they're gonna give you uh, there's a range that they can pay you for that position 99.9% .9 of the time they're gonna offer you the less so they're gonna offer you the smallest amount that they can you have you know you have room to negotiate so if they say, oh, the, you, and you look online, look up what what are these positions, you know, what what are people getting paid for these positions with your uh, set skill sets? So 
look it up, negotiate. I always, my rule of thumb is always go about $10,000 more than what, what they're offering. Because if you fall somewhere in between, you just got what, $5,000 more than what you, they were first offering you, always, always negotiate. And this goes mainly, well, not mainly, but especially for females, always negotiate. And that that's important too for um, realizing that they they've already invested a lot of time into you. If they're giving you a job offer, how many hours did they just spend interviewing you? How many hours did you invest into the company? That's your leverage. That's saying, hey, if you're offering me this position, the reason why I have power at the table is because you got to know me and you wanted to give me that offer. Now, you don't want to be stubborn about it, right? They they probably did interview other people, but they found that you were the right fit for the job. And because of that, that's your your power at, at the negotiating table. Um, and like I said, sometimes they say, sorry, we've got a flat rate. This is what we pay. Um, Netflix is notorious for that. Netflix is known for being a pretty high payer for their salaries, but they do not negotiate. They say, we already take the industry standard. We pay over that. And what we offer is what we can offer. If you can find a better salary somewhere else, good luck and, and enjoy the enjoy that position. Some companies will will do that, but um, negotiating through that is is definitely very, uh, very important. And if if you have questions, we do not we do not go away after graduation, right? If you get a job offer, if you have questions, Latonia did that. She came to me and said, "Hey, I've got I've got this job offer. What do you recommend? What would you send back in this email? How would you counter this?" We we can totally do that. Um, I can say a, a job as a junior software developer, you should be looking at at least the sixty to sixty five thousand dollar range a year. Um, for salary. There may be some exceptions to that if you're going in as an apprentice or an internship. If there's some limited um, starter salary for three months or six months, that may be an exception to that. But um, you should be at that 60, 65 range. Within two to three years, you should be at the 75 range. Um, and when you've got five plus years of experience, if you've worked your way up to that senior job title, you can easily be clearing six figures within a five-year period. And that goes even for, for Syracuse-based shops. Max, I had another thought I wanted to share. You actually mentioned me, but um, I got a tech job right out of the cohort I was in. Um, it wasn't direct to coding, but it was in tech. And that was a result of my mock interview. So I wanted to share those two things that um, you can get a job as a result of your mock interview. And um, like I just showed up like business casual. I did all this crazy stuff, setting up my workstation. Like I wanted to look a certain way. I didn't want the camera like up my nose or anything like that. And um, Laura helped me too. Um, when they offered like the salary, I was like, okay, this is what they're saying. And like, we had some discussion around, you know, what, how I could counter and whether I should do it verbally or versus email, like just really kind of granular in approaching that. So I just wanted to put that out there that even though it's for the practice, you definitely want to get the practice and please don't feel pressured. Still know that you could do a good job and someone is going to go out and advocate for you and say, this person was really solid. And then you'll get some opportunities out of it and take notes, you're going to freeze up, you're going to be nervous, and then you're going to get to the end of it and then be like, oh my God, what just happened? And you're going to have no, you're going to have a vibe of whether the interview went well or not. Oftentimes, if you think it didn't go well, that's an incorrect vibe. That's just your nerves talking to you, but you're going to get home and you're going to go, all right, thank you note. I got to send a thank you note right away. And then you're not going to remember anything about that that interview. I can't tell you, I've been in interviews with three different interviewers, and I couldn't remember a single one of their names. Why? Because they introduced themselves, they told me their titles, and I didn't write it down. And I went, okay, if I were taking notes, if I were thinking about my action items, if I'm thinking about what I, I need to know after this meeting, I need to write that stuff down. Titles are very important. And I think I even added a note uh, that I shared in the live stream. 
always know the title of who you're interviewing with before you even go into the interview. 99% of the time, it's in their email signature, and you can extract that information out when you're scheduling. But if you don't know, shoot them a message. No, I take that back. Look in their email signature, number one. Two, look at their LinkedIn. Get some background on them. Know how they climbed the career ladder. Sometimes the other companies that they worked at are super interesting. Sometimes you have a connection there and go, oh, you went to SU. I went to SU as well. What college were you in? Or, oh, what was, you know, mention a building, have some kind of personal connection. So if it's not in their email signature and it's not in their LinkedIn, and you have scheduled with them, shoot an email to either the recruiter or them and say, hey, just so I have some context, uh, you know, what, what's your, your job title? Because it's one thing to talk about how frustrating it is to miss a semicolon with someone who knows JavaScript, as opposed to the recruiter who doesn't know the difference between Java and JavaScript. This will be my last little interjection, I promise. So when I interview, I like to, when it's natural, I like to ask questions throughout the interview. I don't like to wait to the end. So I just wanted to put that out there for folks. Like sometimes you'll get to the end and there's not a chance to even ask a question. So if you can work it in naturally throughout the interview, I just prefer to do that. And like, usually I'll have a list. And if you'll have a chance, I'll say, oh, hold on a second. Let me just check my list. That way they know, like I was prepared. Um, I'm going through just to make sure I covered everything. It just adds a little something. Absolutely. That, and that goes to my point of it should not be an interrogation. It should be a conversation. And some people are like, great. How do I not make it be an interrogation? It's not just about having your answers prepared and being concise. It is also about reversing that on the person and saying, oh, uh, you just asked me what tools I use for project management. I use Trello. I find this is super important. I take notes on things. What tools do you guys use inside of your company, right? That's a, a great way to, to think about. And you shouldn't do that every question, right? You don't want to feel like you're interrogating the interviewer, um, but it is as much about you getting excited about the job as it is them getting excited about you doing the job. Okay, you've been lectured to for the past two and a half hours over that now. We are not going to do any code tonight. Uh, I am actually, for maybe the first time in four cohorts, letting you guys go early. With that said, I will stick around um, in case you have any questions. If you're feeling behind, um, if you want to go in a breakout room, I will stick around. Otherwise, you guys should go enjoy your weekends work on your ERDs. Those are due on Sunday. I will personally be going through on Monday and giving you guys all individual feedback on the ERDs um, and any suggested changes on it. So you'll definitely get feedback on that. Um, otherwise, have a great weekend. Be prepared to come in on Monday and start integrating our database directly into our backend code. Um, before everyone leaves, I just wanted to say, so my sister worked as a recruiter for our company here. Uh, JAS in Syracuse. Um, and she did forward me, I have to find it, but she did forward me um, like a great list of interview questions that you can ask and what to expect in, to, in an interview or what you say, literally like verbatim of what you should probably, something along the lines uh, should say. I will be posting that onto Slack for everyone to have because that's how I've gotten majority of my jobs. That's like my holy grail. So I will forward that as soon as I get it, okay? Please do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'll stick around. Don't feel like you need to. If there are any lingering questions, uh, I'm happy to rant as always or answer your, your technical questions. But um, otherwise, have a great weekend. Kalai. I need your help fixing my code from yesterday, Max. Sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> let me request remote. Uh. So I is... think I couldn't keep up with uh, last night, so I watched your video and may I 
I did everything. Uh, but still, I think the back end is not um, following the instruction. I couldn't, uh, uh, the JSON and all didn't uh, upload into the back end. So okay. I had a problem. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple things wrong in the front end. And normally I like to fix the front end before we get into the back end just so we have something to test. Um, so it doesn't look like you have your header file over here, um, but that's okay. We're just gonna comment out the header for now, uh, just because we don't really need that for anything in the back end. And then you've got a period at the beginning of that file name. Oh, yeah. And we wanna camel excuse me, camel case that. So there's our message input is in now, right? And then our message list is also right. Um, so uh, believe it or not, this is actually working. The only thing that we don't have in here is any CSS. Um, so that's why it doesn't, doesn't look great. Um, but it, it, I think has everything in here that we need. So we've got your get messages. We've got a post. We're sending it. And then in your message input, you've got your fetch, the post a message with your content. Everything looks right there. So I'm going to say test and hit send. And go to the console and see from backend is there. We post our rec.body, which is stringified. You've got everything right there. You're using your parser. So in theory, if we come over here, your console logging on line 23. And it doesn't have the message that we sent in. So let's figure out what's going on there. Um, your method post, your message text. That's everything looks right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to console log out our rec.body. And let's just see what's getting sent into the back end. So I'm going to hit the send button again. And here we go. You had it set to info over here, but if I set it to nine messages, it's going to um, not filter anything down so we can see what all of the errors are. So it's saying responded with 404 because got our server post message over here. Uh, you're coming close to stumping me. I don't see anything wrong with this. Uh, refresh, test, and here's all of the data. I have a question. Is that the front end is front end and back end is two different folder is going to affect how this is going to work? Yeah, this is our back end. And that's but they are in two different folders. Like back end is somewhere in the desktop. They're supposed to be. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I think here's here's what's going on. You started the server with npm start. But we don't start the server with npm start. We start the server with npx nodemon server JS. Oh. And we do it with this nodemon because if we make any changes to the server, it won't automatically reboot unless we use nodemon. Okay. So I think what happened was the backend server hadn't been rebooted with all of your changes in it. Okay. So if I come over here and refresh now and do a test and send, 
notice we not only do we got get no okay. errors, but in here we've got both of our messages in there. Okay. So it turns out you had all of the code right in your backend, but because you didn't start the server right, it didn't reboot for your changes. Okay. Sure. Thank so you. You, sh you should be all caught up now. Little CSS that you could move over, but other than that, that you should be good to go. Thank you. No problem. Uh, just a question out of curiosity. Would you ever name the server anything besides server dot anything? Uh, yeah, you can name it index.js. I have seen it called app.js. Um, I've seen it called express.js. Um, I don't know if you've come across anything else, Latonia. Backend.js, I've seen that. Um, Start.js, it, it really doesn't matter what you call it. I do really hate it when someone has their project file and they like bury that like in some folder and I've got to go through like 19 different folders to figure out where the start of all of the code is. Um, but basically wherever that file is, that's what unravels into all the other different files that you may have on your back end. Um, but for the most part, people are pretty consistent on naming it. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call it, as long as it's it's a name that's clear, start.js, whatever you want. Um, you just want people to be able to find it. And npx nodemon is what gets everything up and running, right? Correct. Okay. We could just use node and then whatever the name of our starter file is, but that's when the file won't, the server won't automatically reboot when we make changes. So that's why we use nodemon so that it automatically refreshes. Node mon is just node monitor. And what the monitor is doing is monitoring your files for changes. And when it finds those changes, it automatically reboots that. Oh, I thought it was Jamaican, unless that was a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> That's just, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was someone talking? Oh, I was just going to say on that, generally, don't people just stick to app and index and server? I, no. I have seen, for the most part, yes, okay. app, index, server, um, express. Those are those are the main ones, but it really it really doesn't matter as long as it's concise. Jennifer, were you going to say something? No, I'm sorry. I was just going to joke with Schneider. I try to inject humor because this stuff is so boring otherwise. So you know, spice it up a little bit. Yeah. Anything else for tonight? Is Caitlin on a call right now? I am. I'm working. Oh, hi. Hi, Caitlin. Uh, um, shoot, 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 shoot. I was uh, meeting, uh, do you, I think she said nephew. Um, she works at Macney. I literally forgot her name, even though I was just Taylor. No, 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 not Taylor. Is it a family really? member of mine? Yes, family member. Hmm. I'm not surprised. Wait, 